All right, these next questions are with the singles in the room. What is the most challenging thing about being single in a church family, both on Sunday mornings and throughout the week? Your singleness really is God's gift to you mm -hmm. yeah. to work through issues that you don't have to work. Everything you don't work through in your singleness, you'll work through in marriage. Mm -hmm. And if there's one thing I've learned through marriage is that marriage is kind of a fire, right? Like it exposes impurities mm -hmm. and you don't always handle that well. Some people don't handle that well. So the more you work through and build and grow and become in your singleness, not that there's not good work you're gonna have to do, Mary, but it's just a lot less work you're gonna have to do on yourself mm -hmm. once responsibilities and obligations kick in. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I would just like encourage mm -hmm. everyone, myself, like really, I love this time because you can spend the most amount of time with God. Mm -hmm. You can kind of fix your heart to the posture you want and need it to be. And I think our desire is to be a godly spouse. Mm -hmm. So becoming that outside of marriage and making sure my focus and priorities and heart posture is right now allows me to much easier step into that role of a godly wife with the support of a godly husband mm -hmm. when it gets to that point. Yeah. I think sometimes it can get a little lonely. Like you're not alone, mm -hmm. you know, because you're around people and you're walking with the Lord and so you're not alone. But we're human. We yeah. have human tendon disease and so when you're looking around and everybody's partnered up or married or with their kids and you're just kind of like off to the side alone. It, yeah. It can it can be a little lonely sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think the hard thing in a church family is finding the right people because it's humbling to ask somebody for help. Yeah. Like, how do I, how do I, um, uh, what's the word? Um, not chase, but how do I court, court a girl, right? You know, and you trust court. her. Yeah, court, yeah, that's a good word, yeah. Um, but uh, so it's like, um, so it's like, it's hard because like, how do I, number one, who do I go to for that? That's number one. And number two, do they even want to help me with this? You know, and then so it that's where it can get hard for me. You know, it's like there's so many people here. Like, who can I ask for help? Who who can help me with this? Right? You know, it's kind of the beautiful bridge to the next question. <laughs> <laughs> what are the blessings and singleness that others might find surprising? For me, not being distracted. You know, I feel like dating can can suck a lot out of you and it can distract you and it can make you idolize a relationship other than your relationship with God and so it takes away from your relationship with God so for me it's just been not having that distraction yeah, and you do you have that time and mm -hmm. it's such a blessing and you can have as much of it as you want <laughs> however you want however you want and end, it's it's a beautiful thing for mm -hmm. The singles, what would you like your church family to know about singleness? I want to say just treat them the same way you would treat somebody. Like, don't, like, I would, I would say just try to try to bring Jesus out of them. as much, and, and, and I think, like, discipleship, and I think, like, not even just in date, like dating and things, but just not, not teaching, but just help me... Um, be more like Jesus, right? You know what I mean? And that's treating me like anybody else, you know? Amen. We've been having this conversation as a church family for the past couple of weeks, and we're in this series, Family Circus, where we're learning how we can live together, uh, being God's family, even though we find ourselves in different seasons and stages of life. Uh, and today, as you can tell, we're going to be talking about singleness. Last week, we kicked off talking about parenting, uh, and next week, we're going to talk about marriage. Here's the thing. One, uh, through this series, one of my prayers is that we deepen our empathy for each other. So this conversation that we're hearing around this table is great to be like a fly on the wall hearing that. But this, these are also the conversations we're going to be having in our life groups uh, for these few weeks. And uh, my mom has spent some time as a dog trainer. And so one of the sayings that she had as a dog trainer was, I'm not really training the people. I'm, I'm not training the dogs. I'm training the people. And so that's a little bit how I feel today. Uh, because she was saying like, 
I'm training the people because we don't always recognize when we're communicating the wrong thing to a dog. And now for, for today, I feel a little bit like I want to talk to the singles that are here in our church family, but I also want to kind of be talking to those who are like me and are married because oftentimes we may be communicating the wrong things to those who are single within our church family. And here's just like off the bat, this is what I want to say. Singleness is not a shortcoming. It's not a shortcoming. You're not like a uh, half of a person because you're not married to somebody else. Uh, and Jesus was never married. Uh, the Apostle Paul was not married during his time in ministry. And if you just look at, over uh, church history, the people that God has used uh, as heroes of our faith, like there's a lot of them that are single. Uh, the African theologian St. Augustine, uh, Corey Ten Boom, Mother Teresa, uh, Henry Nouwen, like these heroes of our faith who God has used, uh, and it's their singleness is a part of their life. And so today, I want to define singleness just as anyone who is not married, which I know is a very broad definition. So there could be like a lot of different specifics of like what that might entail. So today, you could be dating but not married, or you could be not dating but kind of wishing that you were, or you could be not dating someone and you have no plans of doing so. You could also be someone who is wrestling uh, with your sexual orientation and wondering, how do I live out faithfully in, in, in this part of my life? Or you could be a widow. You could be a widower. Uh, so even just like as I'm listing those different stages, you, you're starting to get a sense of how complex and challenging it must be today to be someone who is single, which is why we want to pay attention even if we're not single today, because uh, we want to walk with one another through whatever stage of life that we find ourselves in. And here's the thing, uh, what, I think a lot of the challenges that we might face uh, as singles comes from the fact that we have these messages that are broadcast all the time that our worth, that our value comes from romantic relationships. Like we kind of just have this obsession with romance. You know, like on Facebook, if you put the status in a relationship, we assume the romance. Like, we just automatically intuit that, right? Uh, most of our popular music today is about uh, desire. It's about romance and attraction. Like in most movies, if it's not like the primary plot of the movie, it's at least a strong subplot. Someone kindling a romance with someone else, and that's like part of the happy ending. Uh, the beauty industry is a $625 billion juggernaut that makes its money off of people's desire to be desired. <laughs> like we want to be attractive, and so this is how they make money. And so, like I said, I think we kind of got this obsession with romance, with desire. Now, outside of the church, that obsession uh, is almost like an I idolatry of sex. W in the church, oftentimes, I would say we even idolize marriage. We make it like this ultimate goal that, that somehow you're not a complete person until you're married. And so this comes through the things that we communicate. It comes through the things that we say. Uh, so m you, if you're single, you've probably had someone say to you, like, especially, you know, once you're an adult, like, when are you finally going to find that person and settle down and get married? Uh, or you can meet someone married. Like, I've made this mistake before. Like, I meet someone who's single. I know almost nothing about them. And I go, ah, oh, there's this really great Christian boy or girl that you should totally get connected with. I think you'd it off. Uh, like, I know nothing about them, and it's like this way of I'm, I'm trying to fix them somehow. Or I've also seen this happen where uh, it's someone's wedding day, and someone says to someone else, now your life begins, right? So these messages that we say, or at, at the very least, it's implied through what we do with how we behave. And here's the thing, this is not found anywhere in Scripture. <laughs> like, this is not the core message of, of Scripture, as the, you know, you're not complete without a spouse. And uh, so this is what we're going to talk about uh, today. My name is Jonathan. I'm, I'm one of the pastors here. And so turn with me in your Bibles to Galatians 3. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation uh, today. And uh, 
The book of Galatians is written by the Apostle Paul, who planted a church in a place called Galatia. So he plants this church, and then when he leaves to go uh, continue his church planting, uh, there's some controversy that starts to brew in Galatia, the Galatian church. And so this is why pa the Apostle Paul is writing to this church. It's because there's some uh, Jewish teachers that are there who are followers of Jesus, but they're teaching that, like, it's not just enough that you entrust your life to Jesus as your Lord. You also need to continue to adhere to uh, the Torah, the Jewish law, what we call our Old Testament today. Uh, they're saying, yeah, following Jesus is great, but you've also got to do all this other stuff, especially circumcision, which, like, imagine being an adult, and you're a Gentile, right? So a Gentile is just anyone who's non-Jewish. You come to a faith in Jesus, which Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. Jesus himself is Jewish. And so then you find out, uh, yeah, Welcome to our faith. You got to get circumcised now. And you're like, wow, this is uh, not what I thought I was signing up for. And so this message that these Jewish teachers are teaching is not the gospel. It's the gospel plus. Like, yes, faith in Jesus plus the Old Testament commands. That's how you are saved. Uh, and so it, the first couple chapters Paul talks about how his message, his gospel, is not authored by humans. It's authored by God. And then in the center of this letter, hear what we're going to read, start, uh, Galatians 3, starting in verse 26, is like this explosive theology that Paul lays out, and it has a ton of implications for how we live our life. And so I'm going to apply this today uh, to the idea of singleness. So follow along with me, Galatians 3, starting in verse 26. Paul writes, for you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ, like putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. Now here's what Paul is driving at here, is that choosing Jesus makes us chosen family. When you place your faith in Jesus, when you choose Jesus, you become a part of the chosen family of God. Now, there's the idea of chosen family is a pretty popular one today, and that's because we live in a really fractured world where people may experience alienation or rejection from their family of origin. And so then they go out, they find like-minded people, and this is a term that we often use now. They are my chosen family family, which is a powerful thing. And I think we have a lot to learn from that. But I, I think what Paul is driving at here is even more powerful, that in Jesus, God has chosen us. God desires us. And how do we know this? It's because of Jesus. God comes as Jesus to, so we would know what he's like and so that we would know his great desire to be with us. And this is what we see happening on the cross that we see G God's great desire for us in Jesus that no amount of hardship, no amount of suffering can tear him away from his singular focus, which is to be united with us. And even this is what marriage is designed for, is so that we can experience a part of that now, uh, before we get to heaven. But then also, for those of us who are not married, we still get to experience that now just in different ways, different fashions. And so... Uh, the idea of chosen family, that is a high calling that Paul is pointing towards here. And this is really all sourced from uh, Genesis 12, where God chooses a guy named Abraham. So Abraham, he's this old nomadic dude who uh, has no kids, but God promises, I'm going to make your family into a great nation that's going to bless all other nations. And so the Jewish people were descended from Abraham. Jesus himself is Jewish. 
And so this is this great faith that's being possessed by the Jew Jewish people who are uh, called God's children. But now in Jesus, Jesus has fulfilled everything the Jewish people were called to be. Uh, all the promises that are given to Abraham are what we now receive as those who put their faith in Christ. And so because we put our trust in Jesus, we now are children of that same promise. But, uh, this is what Paul is talking about, verse 29. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God, God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. Now, this is not the message that the, the Jewish Christian teachers are giving the Galatian church. They've put them into a frenzy because they've said, you're not really the children of God. You're not really the children of Abraham because if you were, then you need to observe all of this stuff. You need to do all of these Jewish cultural things in order to really receive this new identity. But Paul is saying, like, no, this is, this is what we receive as those who put their faith in Christ. This isn't about blood relation, which is what it was for the Jewish people. This is about faith. Faith in Jesus is what gives us access to this. And so this message of saving faith in Christ Jesus, that's the gospel. And so a core part of this gospel is we are chosen as God's family. And this is something that's been brought to us, and we see that being played out in Scripture through Abraham. And so this is why I think it is tragic when the church falls for any kind of gospel plus kind of thinking. And, and this is what I really think that we've done with the idolatry of marriage. Yeah, sure, it's great that you have like a saving faith in Jesus. That's awesome. But when are you going to get married? Like you really haven't lived until you've been married. And so this is, that's just not the gospel. This is not what we hear uh, through Scripture. And so this comes through in the things that we say to those uh, who are single. Like we've got these misconceptions that are often like piped in from our cultural narratives. And, and so we fall for this within uh, the church. And I think it has real co world consequences. I have a friend who was not hired for a ministry position at a church because he was not married. Like they saw this as a mark against him. And so this has no place for us in the church, and we want to kind of fix these misconceptions. Because, you know, popular misconceptions can really, like, linger for a long time. And some of them, like, they don't matter quite as much. Now, I was a child of the 90s, and so parents in the 90s were all about, like, you cannot sit too close to the TV. If you're too close to the TV, you're going to make your eyesight go bad, right? Did anybody else hear this whenever they were growing up, right? Okay, and so I, I remember thinking later, man, if there was this many kids that were, like, impacted with bad vision or something, they should have, like, a commercial, like a, a public service announcement where you just get all these, like, kids with terrible vision and their super thick glasses to share their testimony of how they didn't listen to their parents, and they sat too close to the screen, but they couldn't find all those kids because it's just not true. <laughs> this is a misconception. Uh, another popular misconception that I remember was big then, I don't know if it is now anymore, uh, but there's this whole thing about like driving at night with your interior lights on. Like, don't leave your interior lights on because the cops will pull you over. Uh, and here's the thing though, in American history to this day, there has not been one person who has ever gotten a ticket for driving at night with their interior lights on because it's just not true. This is a misconception. And so we want to take these misconceptions that we might perpetuate to those who are single today, and what we're going to do is we're going to re replace it with God's truth that we find here in Galatians 3. And here's misconception number one. I am incomplete. Like as a single person that for some reason, because I'm not married to someone else, I am incomplete. Now, I think part of this might come from, like, when you're married, uh, if you introduce your spouse to someone else, you say, hey, this is my other half. And, and so that's true, actually, of marriage. Like, th the mystery of marriage is that the two become one. We're going to talk about that next week. And so that is true, in fact, whenever you're married and you introduce someone in that way. But this is not as though if you're single that you're just half of a person who is only going to be complete when you finally find that other half. But we send these messages as like, hey, you not dating, you being alone, like somehow something's off with this. Uh, author Christina Hitchcock writes about this in her book about singleness. Now, she was not married until she was uh, in her 30s, but she had never even dated 
someone until she dated the, the guy who became her husband. Uh, and so she writes about this moment where she's, um, she's just recently gotten out of graduate school, so she's like well into her 20s, and all of her friends are getting married, all of her friends are getting engaged, and so she starts to feel this like, man, what's wrong with me right now? Because I haven't even so much as dated someone. And I think that part of this is like perceptions she's dealing with from outside of her, like people being like, what's up with you? Like, what's off? Because you haven't dated anyone. And she said, my lack of romantic life caused me to call my identity into question to the point of an identity crisis. A crisis of identity purely because you're a single. Like that to me, I don't think that's an isolated case. Like, I think that's a normal thing, and I think that that is tragic. Uh, because many people are single uh, by choice. Like, they're not looking for a romantic relationship, but others are single out of circumstance. Like, it's just the, the circumstances that you've been handed. That should not be the indication that something is wrong with you. Your humanity should be that indication. Because if you've met married people, we're a terrible mess too, okay? Like this is a part of being sinful, flawed people. Like we got these defects. And so this is not just because you're a single that somehow you have that or as though like you are absolved of that because you are married. And so this is the truth that we find in scripture. Here it is. Jesus determines my identity. Let's say that together. Jesus determines my identity. That's right. Verse 27, Paul says this, and all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ, like putting on new clothes. Now, in the past few weeks, we've seen 124 folks within the Crossroads family uh, be, be baptized or reaffirm their baptism. And so we talk about baptism as a mark of inclusion in God's family. And that's because, like, the reality of what's happening in baptism is you're a, your old identity goes down in the water. It's put to death with Christ on the cross. And then whenever you're raised out of the water, this is what your new life, your new identity is rising out of the water in Jesus. That is such a powerful thing. And even for me, I had my baptism reaffirmed, and I will tell you one of the most powerful parts of, of being immersed in those waters is being carried. It's, it's a very strange feeling as an adult to be carried, like being brought down into the water and raised up. And it's not that I'm doing this, but that it's being done for me. And this is the truth of what's happening for us in Jesus. My identity has nothing to do with what I've done. It's all what Jesus has done for me. And so this is the beauty of baptism. And Paul is saying when you're baptized into the faith, you've got this new identity and it's anchored in Christ Jesus. It does not waver. It does not change and so I think the analogy that he's using here is really helpful. It's like putting on new clothes, he says. And isn't clothing today like a, an expression of our identity? Like, here's what I mean. A couple weeks ago for July 4th, many of us were wearing red, white, and blue as a, an expression of our identity as an American citizen. Or if you go to a concert, you'll see a lot of people like who are wearing, uh, they put on these clothes, they're wearing uh, the artist on their sh shirt, and this is a way that they are being identified as a fan of this artist or this band. And so I, I think another point of this analogy that Paul is using here that's really helpful is you got to be intentional about it, right? Like you go to your closet, you look at your clothes, and you make a choice of what you're going to wear, and you have to choose to put on this identity in Christ. Because when we're clothed in Christ, that's when we become complete. Not when we're married, but when we are clothed in Christ. So that means you can be married and still very unfulfilled if Christ is not the center of your life. And so I love the, the wisdom that we heard uh, in that video, Jamie, who's opening up there, talking about you know, the problems that you have, the deficiencies you have as someone who is single, like that stays with you whenever you get into a relationship with someone else. And so we don't want to just treat relationships like these band-aids. Uh, where we're just trying to mask these symptoms, mask these problems. What we need to do is live into our identity that Jesus has given us as God's family 
so that we can walk alongside one another. And uh, as John Wesley says, watch over one another in love. So that means all of my defects, uh, you know, I, I work this out in my church family, in my church community, because we're, it's where I'm unconditionally accepted that I can experience transformation. Misconception number two. Here it is. I am alone. And we, we heard this being talked about in the video as well. And what I'm not saying here is that um, if you're single and you feel lonely that you've like believed a lie or anything like that. I'm saying this is a lie that we live into as the church because we have this hyper-individualized culture that we've just kind of like taken part of. Like, so we drive home, we go into our garage, not to see anyone else again until we go out for work the next day. Like, we fail to live into the gift of community that God has given us. And so oftentimes, the, the, the isolation, the loneliness, this is now just like a feature of our individualistic culture. Like, it's a part of just wanting to go it alone, do things myself, and this is just not who the church is called to be. And I think the pandemic uh, revealed to us that more than ever that we need to live th this next truth. Here it is. I have a forever family. This is the truth. Let's say that together. I have a forever family. This is what's true if you call Jesus your Lord. Paul says in verse 28, there's no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And this is because Jesus breaks down every division from person to person, from category to category, so that we can all live united with each other just as God is united with us in Jesus. And so I think we have this golden opportunity as the church to be this shining example of what it looks like to live uh, invested and involved in the lives of those that we're not related to and to walk in deep friendship with one another. Because here's what I want to say, it, like someone who is single should never be doomed to isolation purely because of their status as, as singles. Uh, now, David Bennett is a gay Christian who has lived out his faith in choosing to remain uh, celibate. So cel celibacy is choosing to abstain from sex. And so his testimony is like this picture of fidelity to Jesus. And, and he is very honest uh, about the shortcomings of the church. And this is one of the things that he wrote in his book, A War of Loves. He says, a weak culture of friendship and fellowship excludes LGBTQ people and forces them to look for intimacy in the wrong places. We need a community life like the one modeled in Acts, in which believers lived as a new family in the light of Jesus's life and mission to the nations. So I think that he's not just giving voice there to LGBTQ folks, but also like single folks uh, more broadly speaking. And, and so this leads to misconception number three, which is I need sex. Like uh, in our culture, it's, uh, sex is treated like this essential part of your life. And so to cut off sex is like a uh, robbing someone of uh, something that is essential to them. And, and so we see this depicted in movies like The 40-Year-Old Virgin. Uh, like, so the, the whole uh, premise of the movie is based on like what the title is about. And so like, it's supposed to be this automatic punchline that a guy hasn't had sex by the time he's 40 years old. And so like all these guys that become his friends, they try to fix his situation. And so at the end of the movie, they have succeeded in doing so. And he's cast as like being liberated, like he's dancing around. Uh, it, it's ridiculous. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, it, it's got some funny points to the movie. You don't have to watch it. That's not what I'm recommending today. But uh, here is the truth of Scripture, is that for those who are not married, uh, the call is towards fidelity to Jesus through celibacy. But here's the truth for those who call Jesus Lord. I can experience intimacy. I can experience intimacy. I love what Shane Claiborne writes about this. He says, Our deepest longing is not for sex, but for love. We can live without sex, 
but we cannot live without love. And there are certainly many folks who have had a lot of sex, but never find love. And others who may never have sex, but who have found love and intimacy in the deepest core of their being. So Paul, in verse 26, he says, for you are all children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And I, like, I got two brothers, and let me tell you, like, growing up, there's like a bond that you have when you have siblings there, if you've experienced that, uh, if you've experienced the gift of being fellow children. And that's, that's a bond that we can experience here today as God's family, because this is the reality, is in heaven, there is no isolation. There is no loneliness. Uh, in the resurrection, there is no one that's going to be given in marriage, Jesus says. That's because marriage is this way of uh, mirroring what God, what God is going to do for us eternally. So in the resurrection life to come, we are going to be living perfectly in community. And guess what? Our prayer and the Lord's prayer is uh, here on earth as it is in heaven. And so we want to live out this heavenly reality right here and now. Uh, as a church family. And so I've, I've always been so amazed uh, at how I've seen Crossroaders live out this truth in just really countercultural ways. Uh, you might remember Pastor James Roberts. And I remember uh, Pastor James, he spent quite, quite some time here at Crossroads. And one of the things that he uh, was a part of his life was he had these two guys that he invited to live with he and his family. And you didn't get the sense that he's doing so like out of pity, but that it's like this joyful expression of what it looks like to live in the family of God. And so these men lived with James, his wife, and, and their child for a number of years until they're old enough, like they, they eventually got married and they're out of the house. Uh, but this joyful expression of what it looks like to be God's family, he's not the only person that I've seen uh, do that either. And so it's not like, it, I also want to say, you don't have to live with someone else <laughs> in order to live out this reality. Like in our life groups, we have this golden opportunity to just walk alongside of those who have a different status than us. And so I think one of the biggest gifts that we can give each other is intimacy. Uh, and so intimacy requires an openness to being involved and invested in each other's life right? Uh, that's the gift of intimacy. And I love what Pastor Derwin Gray, uh, how he defines intimacy. He calls it, into me you see. That's how he defines intimacy. Where, where we are known, and we know others, and we love each other fully uh, in that place. This is what it looks like to live as God's family. Uh, and so if you're married, I would just say like, how can you share milestones with the singles in your life? Like rather than just going out on double dates, like think of those uh, in your life or in your group who are single to go hang with. Uh, uh, celebrate milestones with each one, one another. Uh, be open to being involved in each other's life. And, and so singles, if you are here uh, uh, in this room today, I want you to just know we see you, we celebrate you, and, and we want to walk alongside of uh, you uh, in God's family. Uh, and so before we pray, I just wanted to give a couple book recommendations. We always want you to be uh, equipped to live out your faith no matter what stage you're in. So here's like a couple of books that I've been using uh, just even uh, developing this message that have been really helpful and that I would highly recommend to others. But let's, let's close in prayer and, and just lift up our brothers and sisters today who are with us and are single. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for this gospel truth that because of Jesus, you have chosen us to live in your family, God, that you desire us. And so for any of those who feel undesired or unwanted, God, we pray that you would just displace that feeling uh, for a sense of belonging in your family. And God, we, more than just a feeling of belonging, we pray that we would have the strength to live that as your church, as your people. Uh, Heavenly Father, we, we pray for those who are single that you would just continue to empower them with your spirit, give them all that they need for their life of faith. God, we thank you for their leadership, for their gifts, for their contributions to our church family. God, we pray that we as a church may be one as you are one. And so God, we just lift this up in the name of Jesus who calls us uh, your children. Amen.
Amen. 